welcome to our garden. Today I'm going to take you on another garden tour. My name is Rose and I have a serious passion to help inspire and educate others to grow their own food. We are having a major heat wave here in Georgia. We are using these impatience, these New Guinea impatience, as indicator species. They're the canary in the coal mine, so to speak, telling us when things need to be watered. So we know that our beds have dried out considerably if we see them wilting like this. So these wonderful custom planter boxes that Ryan built for me were in essence to give us something to plant up our trellis and our archway. Originally it was going to be scarlet runner beans. My scarlet runner beans I planted in these beds actually just rotted. They didn't sprout at all. So I'm really glad that I went ahead and added some Kajari melon seeds as well because they germinated great. I put three seeds in each hole and I have three plants in each hole. <laughs> so I'm just going to leave them for now. Let them do their thing. I might end up having to thin some out which is really hard for me to do as some of you already know. Okay so we're going to start in the first bed. This is our spring greens bed. It is obviously way past the spring season here in Georgia and they're all struggling so much that we have made the decision that this bed is going to be pulled and we're going to plant some new stuff in its place. So the first step to that is to harvest some of it is going to be harvested for our own use and some of it is going to be just given to the chickens. The cabbage. No heads formed. The greens are pretty holy. I'm going to give it to the chickens. They'll really enjoy this. So I keep a bucket for the chickens and a basket for us. The kale is not as holy as it was. Uh, the BT worked great for the cabbage moth caterpillar that was on it but it is starting to elongate and I'd rather eat it now before it gets bitter because it's bolting and going to seed so again I'm just gonna cut it I might have needed my big velcros for this I am cutting these off at the base because it's good to leave those roots in the ground to rot and feed the soil with more compost I will break each one of these leaves off of this stem when I go to cook it. For now, I'm just gonna put it in the bucket just like that. Don't need, don't need those. Those can go to the chickens and my kale will go in for kitchen prep. Now, while our Swiss chard might keep going through the summer months okay, we actually ended up with a fungal leaf spot on our Swiss chard. Um, this one's not so bad, but if you see this leaf here. As you can see, this leaf here, the spots have taken over. And this is something that I don't want to keep in my garden. I'd rather remove it from the garden and feed it to the chickens. So some of the leaves will be eating. The fungus isn't going to hurt us. But when they're at this stage, the chickens will enjoy it. All right, so the Swiss chard, I'm taking the outer leaves and the inner leaves with me. So I'm just cutting it off. I'm putting it right in the basket. We actually eat the Swiss chard stem with our leaves and we thoroughly enjoy them. Oh, get you untangled. Sometimes when you have a bed that you are pulling, you have things that you're not pulling. Like these cucumbers. They are going to stay. So I'm going to carefully pull it off of that Swiss chard and I will get something for it to climb that works out a little better for it than Swiss chard. So that's a pretty good, decent amount that will provide our family with at least two, possibly three different side dishes for three different meals. So I'm leaving some of these lettuce heads in here. They haven't started to bolt yet. If they do, they'll probably go to the chickens. Um, but for now, we are harvesting a little bit off of these. Whenever we have like taco night and we want some lettuce, we just pull a few leaves off the outside, 
So for now, I am going to leave those. We will replant this garden bed once we have a chance to. We'll probably use our lateral stems that we've rooted from our tomato plants and have a second succession of tomatoes that we'll be harvesting all the way into the fall, possibly as late as Thanksgiving. This is my three bean salad bed that I told you guys about where I plant the tricolor, different color green beans so that I can make a beautiful summer salad with. I also have dragon dung that is now coming up in the center of the bed. I had reseeded this because the first pack of the seed were too old and they did not germinate. I also went through and put in a few extra seeds of some of the ones that looked like they got dug up by the cats most likely. And then our lettuce is bolting there in front of you. You see it's getting long and elongated. The leaves have turned a soft chalky gray color and the flower buds have started to form on top. So this is what we call bolting. When a plant goes from producing just leaves, like the ones on the bottom, to bolting, they are no longer tasty or edible. They're actually quite bitter. So I am leaving them because I'm going to let them go to seed and I will collect the seed off of those so that we can grow more romaine in August. Then on the end here, we have these cucumbers. These cucumbers we purchased from the Asian grocery store without any labels. So we were not sure what we were gonna get, but I can show you exactly because one of them is ready to harvest. Okay, are you ready? <laughs> Wow, look at that. It is so long and beautiful. It's very light skin. If anybody has any guesses as to the cultivar that this might be, I'd love to know. Very, very pale color. And the ones that are forming look like they're gonna be long and skinny too. I can't wait to taste it. I love all cucumbers. I am super excited to see these beautiful little pink blooms starting to open up. These are the first green beans that are beginning to flower and soon we'll see fruit forming on all these little buds. I cannot wait. They definitely seem like they're doing really good. Better than some of my other green beans. Let's go check these guys out. So unfortunately, my Chinese red long beans have become extremely infested with aphids. This is to the level I have never seen before. It is incredible how many aphids have taken over these plants. The aphids are causing some damage on these leaves. You can see that they're curling up. That's how I discovered the problem in the first place. I hadn't seen them. Um, when the population was small, so I missed that important window. And that's something that I really want to stress on everybody, is that if you're monitoring your garden and looking at each plant individually every day, you will catch your pest infestations before they become a problem and you can manually remove them. So normally what I would do with aphids is I would spray them with the hose or wipe them off with my thumb even. Some people like to wear gloves to do that, but they're soft-bodied insects, so they're very easy to kill without using any pesticides. You don't even need to use organic ones. But if you do get to the point where you need to use an organic pesticide, neem oil works really well. Just do not spray it on anything that has flowers and do not spray any flowers because neem oil is harmful to beneficial insects if they come in contact with it. But with the levels at this high, we have reached our threshold and we have to do something. I experimented on a few of them with some neem oil and because the population was so high it hardly even made a difference. So the next step for us is to get some ladybugs in here. So we have a shipment of ladybugs on the way to help fight and control these aphids. Then these awesome gourd beans, they're not really beans but they're called beans, these are the snake beans and they're going to be really big. They're already climbing the poles and they're looking really good. So I'm super excited to see how that goes. I do have to kind of train them a little bit as they grow. I try to make sure that they stick up to there on the poles. And I do need to add some strings hanging down so that these middle beans will have something to cling to to go straight up. Then over here on this side, we have the winged beans. They are not doing great. 
Their aphids are not as prolific, but you can tell that they have had some aphid damage. So I'm hoping that they bounce back once we get these aphids under control. Guys, 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 you get to experience this moment with me. So I was gonna talk about the squash beetles, but hold on. Look, look, do you see that right there? This is the tiniest baby squash I've ever seen. It's so cute. So that is a female squash flower, and as long as it gets pollinated by some of these other male flowers, you see these longer stemmed blooms that are coming out? Those are gonna be male flowers. The female flowers are short, and they always have a little squash at the base of them. And the male flowers are longer, and once they open up, they will pollinate that one as well. Almost always squash start out with male flowers and sometimes people think, oh no, I'm not getting any squash, they keep blooming. But don't worry, have patience, the female flowers are shortly behind those male flowers. When I see these circular cutouts on my plant, they might be still intact with the leaf, but if I see that half circle shape or even sometimes spiral shapes, I know that I have squash beetles in this bed. So the squash beetle is not like the squash bug or the squash vine borer. These look like little ladybugs, except they're kind of more of an orangey brown color and they're fatter looking to me. And they will chew and eat the leaves and their larvae are, um, they look like a yellow furry round caterpillar. They're not long, they're just kind of small and they have yellow hair across their back. I guess it's hair. I don't know if it's hair, but it looks like hair. So they're little yellow, little yellow furry guys, and they are destructive. They will eat up the leaves. You do want to keep an eye out for this kind of damage, and I pick them off. I hand pick them. But in order to hand pick them, I have to be out here in the morning when they are active, or I won't see them. So at this time of day, they've already gone into hiding. Right. Uh-oh. This is one of the things that you want to look for, and this is why you look on the underside of the leaves. These are the eggs of the squash beetle. We don't want those, so you can take a piece of duct tape and remove them and smash them, or you can just do it with your fingers. Smash them, smash them, smash them. You will not grow here. So this is just another reason to show how important monitoring your plants is, because if I had not been monitoring, all of those would have hatched and made a great amount of damage before I would see the actual beetles because it would start out in the larva stage and they're small and furry and cute and you don't notice them and then it gets into the beetle that looks like a ladybug which tricks you and makes you not want to kill them and then before you know it you have a bunch of damage on the plant. Now there is one more sign of damage that I'm afraid I'm seeing right now. So let's get in a closer look at this and see if it's what I think it could be. All right, so down here on the stem of this squash plant, I see this right here. All right, so this right here is usually an indication that the squash vine borer has entered my plant. Now this is a little bit higher up than I'm used to seeing, so I'm not exactly positive that that's what this is but it's definitely a sign that I am looking out for. So squash vine borer are actually really hard to stay on top of. And one of the reasons why I picked this squash, which is the lemon squash, is because it is resistant to the vine borer. And I think it has something to do with how thick the stem is at the base, which is where they normally will lay their eggs and their larva will tunnel into the stem and go down and go up and eat from the inside out and what you'll see is a wilted plant and you'll be like why is it wilting I just watered it and then you discover that it has been invaded by, by the vine borer sometimes you'll see it come out the fruit and that's when you first discover it other times it's because you see it split open at the bottom with ooze coming out so one way that we can fight that is to apply BT to the base of the stem I would not have applied BT that high up on the stem if I was applying it for squash vine borer. So I'm kind of hoping that that was just an injury, like maybe the cat bumped into it and the sap oozed out a little bit from that injury. 
but what I'm probably going to go ahead and do to be on the safe side is get one of our syringes that we use for the animal treatment stuff and pull some BT into that and inject it into the squash stem. Now the squash stem is a hollow tube. So when I go in with the needle, I'm going to go in with the needle into that hollow center, inject the BT into there and pull my needle out. I'm not going to go all the way through. I'm just going to have one piercing point and then that tunnel on the inside of the tube of the squash stem will fill up with BT so that if any larvae do get in there, they will eat from the inside out and they will eat the BT which will destroy them. Now this bed here is one that I have replanted zucchini again and the seed didn't come up. I went ahead and I put out the rest of the seed because I was suspecting that it was just too old and I've been proven correctly on that one. So now I know that I am out of zucchini seed and I'm going to need to buy some next season. The plants down the middle are the tomato cuttings that I did a video about how to root your tomato cuttings. This is the plants and you can see how wonderful they are doing even in this amazing heat wave that we've been having in Georgia. I've been keeping them well watered and they have transitioned just fine. Okay, so as you can see the tiny little baby ground cherries that I planted just a few weeks ago have grown quite a bit. In fact, I was noticing there's flowers on that fruit up there and that fruit there, but there's actually a fruit formed already. Little baby fruit forming and lots more blooms coming behind it. So I'm super excited to have plenty of ground cherries to eat and enjoy. All right, so this was kind of a failure bed. We had some grocery store potatoes that we planted in here. They're already dying back when our other potatoes haven't even started dying back. So there may be some potatoes down underneath here, but I'm not hopeful of it. The uh, rest of the bed, I actually went through and seeded a bunch of my older cucumber seeds in hopes that they would take off here and just trail along. But none of those germinated either. So it's a good thing I'm getting through all of these older seed and I'm getting my stash cleaned out with some experiments here and there. But the good thing is, is that come spring, I'll know exactly what I need to reorder and I won't have old seed just sitting around not being used. And you can see that our running okra has a little friend visiting. Hello. You're a pretty color blue. I don't want to disturb you, but I need to train my... <laughs> He's like, I'm just going to go up here and sit right here. So what I'm doing with the running okra, which is a actually a gourd is I am weaving it through as it grows giving it the desire to climb this cage so every couple of days I have to do that because it's grown a couple of inches see this one has already tendrilled but it tendrilled in a spot I don't want it to so I'm just gonna cut the tendril right there It'll regrow, don't worry. And I'm going to wrap it around where I do want it to go. So now this tendril will come over and find this. And I'm going to have that one grow th that way and this one grow this way. Miss Elsie warned me that I planted too many for this spot, but we're going to see how they do. They're going to climb up here and just grow pretty crazy. I did plant one of my extra ground cherries right in the center. It was barely even alive, so I'm kind of excited to see that it made it because I thought it was a dead one. <laughs> and then our wonderful, beautiful, happy, sweet potatoes. I am so excited about this, y'all, because I really didn't think any of these would be growing at all, and instead they're growing like crazy. There's even one coming up in the center that's a new growth that wasn't there last week. So all of these are basically throwaway sweet potatoes. I just chucked the whole potato into the bed. Worked great. These are grown from cuttings and they are also doing great. I have added some extra compost to these cuttings and I've also put bone meal on all of them. And then these potatoes are doing amazingly well. Uh, definitely 
planted them a little close together, but you know, I learned something. <laughs> when you grow potatoes in compost, they grow a lot bigger. <laughs> so there are some that are flowering, some that have already flowered and have gone to seed. You don't get to see seeds on potato plants very often, so that's kind of cool and fun to see the fruit. And they are all, they have, they have all had bone meal and extra compost piled up to keep healing them and keep healing them. And they still have not turned yellow and died. So we're not ready to dig them up yet. Some people will say after they flower, you should dig them up. But actually, you should always wait, unless you want young potatoes, then dig them up at any point, and they will just be small little baby potatoes. But if you want the biggest potatoes and the largest harvest, wait until the plant dies. When the plant dies, that's when you're gonna find all the potato gold underneath. Then we get to my favorite part of the garden, my tomatoes. Oh, I could just lay in them like a bed. I love that smell. It just brushed against it and I could smell all the essential oils coming off of the trichomes. Mmm, love it. So, as you can see, this, these, these beautiful cherry tomatoes have been popping like crazy. We have harvested them. We have harvested them for frittatas, for tacos. We've just been popping them in our mouths like berries. It's just been so abundant and it's continuing to be abundant as they grow up and up and up to the sky. It's like they just keep growing and growing and growing. So pretty soon they're going to be hanging over the tops of those cages and falling down with showers of tomatoes coming this way by the end of the season. And I love that about cherry tomatoes. They truly are the viniest of all of the tomato plants. So today I am going to harvest all of the red cherries and we are going to make something amazing for Ryan for Father's Day. worth the wait and all of the hard work to be able to pick so many cherry tomatoes at once and to eat as many as I want and not feel guilty that others aren't going to get to enjoy them when I bring them inside. When I go inside the boys are going to go nuts for these. It tastes so good Ryan. You can feed me one. <laughs> you need one too. Mm. All right, I think that's good for cherries. We've already harvested quite a few of these sweet banana peppers and they are continuing to put out fruit. So I'm going to get these two biggest fruit. The more I pick, the more they bloom and put out more fruit. You can see there's a bunch of little ones growing on this one and these have new growth on them that will be forming flowers and producing more fruit. All right, so these bell peppers are doing really good. The plants are healthy. Not a lot of fruit, but I do have one that's been hanging on for a while and it's a pretty decent size, probably not as big as most people would pick, but I'm going ahead to pick it because of the heat wave we're in. I want these pepper plants to not be straining to produce this fruit right now when I can eat this fruit at this size. So it'll be a nice addition to our peppers. And then our cayenne peppers are putting out lots of baby fruit. And we have two beautiful ripe red fruit 
to help season all of this beautiful produce we're bringing in today. As you can see, these Cherokee purple tomatoes are doing really great on this Florida weave trellis. They are holding on nice and tight and producing tons of beautiful fruit that are already beginning to ripen. Okay. But we have a problem, folks. A great big tomato hornworm problem. I've already picked the offender off but not until after he damaged fruit. This fruit right here has been damaged, but I left it on in hopes that it would heal, and it looks like it is healing. Sometimes those spots that the caterpillars eat will rot, and sometimes they will heal over. So I'm leaving it to hopefully see it heal over. So I was out here doing my normal morning and afternoon routine of checking everything in the garden and looking for signs of tomato hornworm damage. Now I have to admit, because of this heat wave, I have not been out here as often as I normally am. And because of that, we had about five or six good sized tomato hornworms that I had to pick off in the last couple of days. So they're here now. I am not trying to rescue them anymore and put them on the nightshade weeds because there's just not enough nightshade weeds for all of these caterpillars. So the chickens have been getting their tomato hornworm treats. As much as I want to keep the population of tomato hornworm under control, it has not reached the threshold level of damage where I would apply BT. It is still at the picking them off and destroying them stage. So one way of doing that is to look for signs of damage, look for signs of frass under the plant and on the leaves, and also to come out here with a black light at night. I have a friend who gifted me one and sent it to me from Amazon. I have not done that yet, but it looks like tonight would probably be a good night to do that. I'm very happy to see that our grocery store cuttings of Thai basil are growing now. They were just surviving for a little bit. Now they're actually starting to grow. So in no time, oh my goodness, I can smell <laughs> just that little bit of touching and I can smell that Thai basil smell. Oh, <sighs> I wonder if they have a bunch of trichomes putting out essential oils too. Probably so. And our little tiny jalapeno peppers. Ryan's going to be so happy about these are just starting to produce. So we'll have some jalapenos before long. Over on this side, our plum tomatoes are continuing to put on tons of fruit and hardly any leaves. It's kind of funny looking. They're almost comical, but hey, if the fruit is coming with hardly any leaf growth, I'm fine with that. And they are being attached to the stakes with some Velcro tape to hold them on as they start to get a little this one needs one now, so I'll add another piece. You have the Velcro tape down here. I'll add another piece up here and attach it to the stick. And that's more than enough for these smaller sized tomato plants. If they had gotten much bigger than this, it would have been a little hard for this stake to hold them, but this is working just fine. And it's a very cheap and affordable way to stake your tomatoes. These big boy are putting on tomatoes. Not a whole lot of them but they are putting them on and there was a tomato hornworm over here that we were able to find and destroy as well. And these early girls are ripening like crazy. If you look, you can see that each one of the plants has two that have ripened already. And then these better boys are actually starting to swell up and blush. So, at this point in the heat wave, the temperatures are too high during the day for the tomatoes to ripen at all. And to be quite honest, when it's this hot outside and you leave the tomatoes on the plant at this stage, they're gonna get kind of mealy and flavorless because the heat is so high that it's stressing it out. So the best thing to do at this point, even before they get to this level orange, I would do it at this point where it's just starting to blush to a yellowish or a whitish color, go ahead and pick those tomatoes early and bring them inside if your temperatures are over 90 degrees. I'm gonna do a video all about why this is important to do and how the science behind it works. 
so be looking out for that and that's the reason why I haven't picked them yet is because I gotta film that video <laughs> all right so our eggplant that was a mystery from the Asian market it did turn out to be the long skinny Asian eggplant and I'm actually gonna harvest them nice and small because I like them when they're nice and small like this plus the more I pick off the more strength the plant can put into producing new ones. When you pick them like this, there's no bitterness. They're very tender and they're wonderful thrown on the grill whole. So it makes it easy for kitchen prep too. I don't have to cut them up. So I'm gonna harvest these three here and they're gonna be a part of Ryan's Father's Day dinner. Lucky guy. Look at that, aren't they beautiful? I love the purple color of eggplants. It's just gorgeous. Oh, there's ants. No, don't bite me. Ants on my eggplants. That must mean I have some aphids too, I bet. So the eggplants have a lot of flea beetle damage. And I've also found another creature on them that I've smushed already. So the flea beetles, I'm just going and pulling them off and pinching them, um, smushing them. They're just tiny little black beetles and they they like to make these little little tiny tiny holes all over the leaves but it doesn't affect the fruit production what i might do at this point because it does seem like the infestation has increased quite a bit because of this heat wave i have not been out as often doing this so i might actually apply some de to the leaves this damage here where it's bigger holes is not caused by the flea beetle this is, well, there's flea beetles all over it, but it's, um, it's actually caused by the 28 spotted lady beetle, which looks just like a ladybug or a squash beetle or a Mexican bean beetle. It's kind of got that same look, but it goes after eggplant. And I didn't know this. I had to do some research because I saw the, um, larva on the leaf and I knew that it looked familiar but I didn't know why it was on my eggplant it looked like the squash beetle larva and so I smushed it but then I looked it up and there is one that's more prone to attacking eggplants so I'm pinching these lower leaves off I don't know if you noticed that while I was babbling on <laughs> but I don't want any leaves that are going to be touching the ground and bringing an easy path for pests to come up the plant like the ants. Now the ants of course can still climb up the stem but the lower leaves were damaged you know they were turning yellow they had been damaged so they're not helping the plant at all so better better off just trimming off anything that's turning yellow like that. And then these tomatoes here in this bed are supposed to be Rutgers. Uh, Miss Elsie and I are both questioning whether they are Rutgers or not. They look a little odd shaped they're kind of like almost pointed in the bottom and records don't do that so we're questioning if these are some type of plum uh, we both got our records from the same place so it is very possible that they were mislabeled and our fairy tale eggplant are doing great they also have flea beetle issues of course but like i said it's something i kind of expect with eggplant and Believe it or not, they are already producing their gorgeous, tiny little fairy tale fruit. These will get about the size of the palm of my hand. I'm talking like the palm of my hand, not my whole hand. So they're just a small fruit. So I'm going to let that one stay on. So it'll be a couple more bites to enjoy. These tomatoes here are our mystery from the Asian store tomato plants. <laughs> so they are starting to put on fruit. They look like they're gonna be a full-size fruit. They don't have a huge number of flowers in their cluster. So I think they're probably gonna be a slicer type tomato, but I'm not 100% sure on that yet. We will see. All right, now we have our blackberry patch, which we really need to get in here and pick a bunch of fruit. And it looks like it's really drying out, so this afternoon when the temperature drops i'm going to put the hose in it and just let it slowly water into the ground a nice good deep watering 
I was going to fertilize, but I was advised not to put out fertilizer with our temperatures as high as they are right now. So it's just going to have to be water for now. But first, let's harvest. Ryan, cameraman, I'm going to need your help with this. Absolutely. What's the one thing you can't stand about picking blackberries? Um, well, ours are thornless, so I can't say that. So today I would say trying not to step on poison ivy while I'm wearing sandals. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely some poison ivy still in there that I didn't get all the way pulled out in the winter. For me, it's not being able to eat them all. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many of them. <laughs> but I, I, I really wanted to make sure that we had enough blackberries to make something with them. So hopefully it'll be blackberry ice cream soon. That would be wonderful. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. And then our last raised bed is one that I'm very proud and happy with. This is the boys' garden. They planted it, they maintain it, they take care of it, and they're doing a great job. They've got flowers in the front, they've got strawberries all over. These tomatoes are putting out some big fruit on them. I don't even remember what tomato plant that was. Uh, this one also has tons of fruit on it. And I'm seeing that their strawberries are flowering and fruiting as well. The mystery Asian squash that I planted in the back of the bed. Ooh, it's got bugs on it right there. Um, is continuing to put out more and more fruit. If you would all come take a look at the squash as it grows. We are trying to figure out what it might be. It was at the Asian market, so there is no telling. It could be some rare, cool variety that nobody's ever seen before. I mean, that's possible, right? Oh, that's a huge one. What? That's giant. There's a really, really huge one. It's like this big, and it kind of looks like a cucumber where it's like striated. Oh! I'm gonna have to have the boys come out and check their garden. Look at that page. The boys have done it. They have grown. Your strawberry starts all the way from just a clump of roots to that. They're gonna be so excited. They did already pick one out of here. So Rowan got the last one, so Liam gets this one. difference two weeks can make. Look how big the corn has grown and how everything has just taken off down here except for these sad peppers. So you can see Ryan has added some compost to these peppers to try to help them. Like I said the peppers were going to be thrown away in the compost anyway so any peppers that survive this crazy planting is going to be well worth the effort. Our green beans are finally starting to flower. I was starting to wonder. Ryan added some compost to some of them um, just to finish out the wheelbarrow that he had here for the peppers and some without so we'll be able to see if there's any benefit. And then we have our overly zealous promiscuous corn that is tasseling long before it should be. This is just this row so I'm wondering 
I'm hoping the rest don't do it and I'm wondering if it's a variety difference because each one of these rows was a different variety except for the last four there was two rows of one type and two rows of the other type on those last four the rest of them were different varieties so I'm going to be really 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 careful that as soon as I see the silk coming out of the corn you can see there is an ear forming there you see it's little top of it right there and how it's kind of fatter right here there you can see it better on this one here there is an ear forming right there but until I see the silk this cannot get on the silk so as these tassels bloom and open the pollen will drop down onto the silk of the ear of corn and if that does not happen and we don't get that cross pollination from this guy to this guy we won't have any corn and that's why you should always plant corn in a block and not just a single row of corn because you want as much cross pollination going in between the stalks as possible you can see on this one it's already starting to bloom so we have got to see some silk because if it blooms without any silk there's not going to be any corn i think this is related to the heat stress i think i think that's what we're seeing here i'm not 100 percent sure i'm not a corn expert but i that's that's my genuine belief these corn on this end are not tasseling i'm glad to see that because these are the ones that seem to be the healthiest there was um some yellowing after the rain and i added the quail fertilizer my poop soup i don't know if you saw that video and they greened right up so it really really helped them and i'm hoping that we can get a full growth out of this corn now behind me this big mass of green might just look like all it is is grass but it's actually quite a bit of food hidden in the grass these are our sweet potatoes and they are coming up really really well and they are doing pretty good i have interplanted some other seeds of some larger vining squash and pumpkin and watermelon but the grass is definitely shading it and at first i thought oh that's horrible i'm such a failure the grass is shading everything out it's gonna make it so nothing grows and then i realized grass does something really important in the heat wave it provides shade and it cools the ground temperature by at least 10 degrees because this grass is here that still doesn't mean i'm not going to come through with a weed eater and get rid of it all but i do like the fact that it is probably providing some support to these plants during this heat wave because if you look at the plants that are in the grass they are not wilted at all whereas the ones where there isn't any grass are completely wilted thus proving my theory now as you come over here you can see that our okra is getting so big and they're starting to have little flower buds coming in these here are our basic traditional clemson spineless really good prolific okra and then these are our baker creek more rare varieties of red okra um this one's the okra jing orange and then this one i think is burgundy red or something like that i'll have to look it up our cucumbers were absolutely over seeded by accident I thought they were going to mostly die. You can see how wilted they are. That's just from this heat wave. Everything needs a good drink and I just haven't been able to get up early enough to come down here and give them a good drink of water. Now, while I do have a ton of weeds growing out here, in this section here we have a ton of what are volunteer marigolds. So they're going to have lots of marigold flowers sprinkled throughout this area then right here we planted two rows of butter peas and one long row of runner peas i have no idea what the difference is if you guys do let me know um these are seeds i got from miss elsie she's been saving for generations now this isn't my garden here this 
is far too perfectly manicured to be mine. <laughs> this is Miss Elsie's beautiful garden. Um, she is just such a hard worker. She's out here all the time taking care of it. And she does such a great job of keeping it weed free. And her okra is doing so much better than mine because of it. And she planted her okra after me. <laughs> and you can see her tomatoes are so lush and healthy. She uses the pine straw as bedding underneath them. And I think that's a brilliant idea. I have done that in the past. I just don't have access to pine straw right now. You can see that her cucumbers are covered in blooms. Lots of male and female flowers. So she's gonna have tons of fruit. Her squash over here, her yellow squash are already producing. They are putting out small fruit. Oh, she must have harvested. So she's already harvested the small fruit. And then in this section here is where we planted peas for her. So I'm hoping, oh, they are starting to come up. Look, Ryan. So those are the runner peas. There's two rows of those. And then a row of um, these guys, butter peas. Yeah, butter peas and runner peas. Don't know the difference. They look the same to me. Hey Ryan, are you feeling dirty? Do you need a shower? I know. Some, uh, some soap for you. I know. Just there, there's rub it on. Conveniently placed bars of soap. Um, so I can stay nice and fresh when I come out to water the garden and I go in the house and you think I smell amazing. So this is an old time trick um, to try to keep the deer away. You hang Irish spring because they don't like the smell. I think these might be more effective for the deer. So this cornfield might be my saddest experiment for the season. We do have some still left but they have been getting ravaged by something pulling them up. So I have three rows of Miss Elsie's corn seed that have just a little bit, but all the other rows completely wiped out, most likely from crows. But all I can do is turn this failure into a hopeful win. I'm gonna go through all of my old seed and I'm gonna pull out anything that's vining and trailing and that's not too late to plant. So pumpkins, squash, gourds, watermelon. I'm gonna get all the older seed, anything that's older than 2020, I think. And I'm going to put it all out, even if it's too much, because I don't know what else to do. If there's birds over here already eating the corn, they're gonna to try to eat a lot of the seeds I put out too. So I'm going to go up and down these rows and just be random about it and see what happens. It'll be an experiment, but I'd rather experiment than not do anything in this space. So we'll see how it goes. All right, that brings us to the front yard orchard. As you can see, the trees that we planted in the beginning of this process are really leaving out beautifully. So they're doing great. The apples especially look really, really good. Um, I think that's a nectarine in the middle, is that right? So. And two cherries. And we have actually added two more plants or three? Two. And since the last garden tour video, we have added two more fruit trees. They are pears that our friend sent us. And I have these three sticks because we actually just got three more in the mail. So what we're going to do is keep everything really, really watered and mulched. It is so important that these beds, that these trees are heavily mulched through this heat wave so that they can survive and not just die because everything else out here is feeling really crispy. But because we've done the proper compost around the outside and then mulch, these trees are really doing better than I could have hoped for. So our bees are doing great over here in the home orchard in our permaculture fruit guild that we have created. And I'm so excited. I just saw like two of them fly on either side of me. So excited to have them so abundantly happy in this front yard area. What I'm doing with these stakes is they're not only for supporting the tree in case we have wind, 
but they are helping me show Ryan where to dig the next hole. So I look at each of the other trees and I make sure that I'm at least 10 to 15 feet away. You don't want them cross branching. These are smaller dwarf varieties, but I still don't want to have an issue when they are full grown. So he'll know by where I place these stakes, where to dig the hole and plant them. One of the hazards of getting bare root fruit trees is that some may not make it. This one had leafed out and now the leaves have turned crispy. We are continuing to water it and treat it like it's alive. And we will keep this in the ground all the way till next spring before we make any decisions on whether it's dead or not. Because there could be some life still in this tree. We have to just really baby it and make sure that the soil stays at the right moisture level. So the strawberries that we planted around our blueberries are bouncing back from transplant shock. We have more strawberries that we will be putting in on all of the fruit trees as a ground cover at the base of every tree. The blueberries did not have a lot of blooms because they were still in pots when they bloomed, but there are some fruit that we've had a snack on here and there. All right, so in my deciding where the next fruit tree is gonna go, like I said, I try to keep 10 to 15 feet away from full-size trees, but trees like blueberries are something I consider understory trees, so it's okay if I go a little bit closer to them, but they are gonna get big, so I don't wanna crowd them too much. But I think we can squeeze in a tree right here it is really dry we really need some rain i can't even get my stake to go in the ground <laughs> you get the idea so now i'm torn between going between these two trees and pulling it this way but we have a dogwood right here that's kind of blocking but this block this dogwood is not going to remain it has to be removed because it's very diseased and damaged in its trunk so i could go right here with the intent of knowing that this is gonna be removed, or I could jump further out this way and put it closer to the blueberries to give a little bit more time for that dogwood to remain. What do you think, Ryan? I think right where you're standing sounds great. <laughs> awesome. That's what I'm gonna do then. It's your hole, you dig it. <laughs> okay. So something that's really important to Ryan and I is to help the local wildlife attract birds to our area. They help with pest control. They're going to eat any of those squash beetles or Japanese beetles that might come looking for some of our fruit trees. So we keep this bird bath full at all times, especially now in this heat wave. This was just filled up last night when Ryan did chores and it's already empty. So it needs to be filled up again. Also, some of the bees will come and get a drink of water from it too. I need to get some glass beads to put in here so that the bees will have something to stand on when they take a drink. Oh, it's my vulture! Did you need a drink, my friend? So I got some of this bio twine for the trees. It is very soft and stretchy. It's kind of like a stretchy t-shirt material. But what's nice about it is after about a year or two, it's gonna start to degrade and fall off. It won't cut into your tree. So I'm gonna cut a piece of that for each of my trees because I put these stakes in, but I didn't tie the trees to it. So this will help support the tree if we have high wind, it just gives it an, a little extra brace while the roots are starting to develop down below. Another way to support our fruit trees and increase their longevity is to create a cage around them at the base. This will prevent rabbits and weed eaters from damaging them. So we'll attach this cage with the pole inside for support. We're gonna attach it with zip ties and we're gonna anchor it down with these staples. Now this isn't quite front yard orchard, but I just kind of wanted to like 
oh, I don't know, show off my gorgeous plants. I love these. They're so pretty. No, seriously. This is part <laughs> of my food. This is this just really sad looking potted container that we got from the grocery store. It has really bounced back a lot. You can see they let it sunburn. So once I get a few more leaves, I'll pinch off these. But they're tiny little mini tomato plants, a basil plant, and a pepper plant. So I am loving it. I'm going to keep it in this pot, even though the pot is too small for it, just because I want to see how good these mini tomato plants are. I don't know what variety it is, so if it's something that I see a lot of success in, I'm going to go ahead and save the seed so that I can have some of my own mini tomatoes. And it was a $20 pot and it was in clearance for $7. So huge, huge rescue. Awesome price to get one, two, three, four plants. Plus I've already cut off a big cluster of basil and I'm rooting it. So it's actually going to end up being even more plants than that. I just absolutely adore everything about my garden. I hope that you guys do too. We have in-ground gardens down below. We have raised bed gardens and we have fruit orchards that we're starting. So there's lots of variety here to see about gardening with us. So if you're interested in learning more about gardening with Rose, then come watch some more episodes. I have a whole gardening playlist I've also got a wealth of other information about goats and homesteading and taking care of animals and an abundant variety of different homesteading topics. So please subscribe to our channel, like, share, comment down below if you have any questions or anything that you'd like to see us make videos about. Let us know and we'll see you next time on Wholesome Roots. <laughs> okay, when you're done shaking, I'll continue talking. <laughs>